Hello, I'm Dr. Reza Jahan. I'm an interventional neuroradiologist and a member of the Interventional Spine Program at the UCLA Medical Center. Today I want to talk to you about a very common cause of back and neck pain called facet degeneration. And you've probably all heard about disc disease and sciatic pain, but facet degeneration is one of the more common causes of back pain that is not discussed very frequently. Let me begin by explaining what is a facet joint. To do that, I have a picture here of a spine as it runs from the neck down to the tailbone. We're going to take a portion of this and blow it up so that we have a bigger magnified view of the spine. The front of the spine is here. Here's the back of the spine over here and we're going to outline where those facet joints are located in the spine. There they are. These are joints that allow the bones in the spine to stack up on top of each other from top to bottom and they are joints similar to your knee joint, your hip joint, shoulder joint. They are very similar in construction to those other joints in our bodies. Now when we look at the side of the spine, we notice the facet joints on one side, but there are actually two facet joints at each level. So when we look at the spine from the back, if we look at this from the back, and this is this view over here, we notice that there is a left facet joint and a right facet joint. So there's a pair of facet joints at each level. Now, these, as I mentioned, provide support for the back of the spine, back here. In the front, you see an empty space here. Well, that's not actually empty. That is filled with an intervertebral disc, or a disc for short, and that provides a cushion, allowing the bones in front of the spine to stack up on top of each other. The two facet joints in the back and the disc in the front form what's called the tricomplex that allow motion to take place in the spine. So when you bend forward or rotate, it is movement of the disc and the facet joints that is allowing you to do those motions. Now, the diagram here shows, for example, how the disc and the facets change as we bend forward or bend backward. So for example, when we bend forward, you notice that the front part of the disc gets squished and the joint back here actually is distracted. you sort of pulling the joint apart from each other, the two bones that comprise the joint apart from each other. Alternatively, when you bend backward, you actually squish the back part of the disc and you kind of push the joint together back there. You're forcing them together back there. Because the facet joints are under constant motion, they are prone to degeneration due to wear and tear. And this, of course, leads to inflammation of the facet joints and arthritis in the joint. Arthritis can cause considerable pain and can cause muscle spasms. Here's a diagram depicting inflammation in a facet joint in the back. And what happens with degeneration, a normal joint de depicted here is composed of a thick, healthy capsule. There is fluid within the joint space. And the surface of the bones in the joint are covered by white cartilage, as you see in this diagram above. That's what a normal joint should look like. What happens with time is the thinning of the capsule, the disappearance of the fluid, and the thinning or complete disappearance of the cartilage. And you end up with an arthritic joint that has little fluid. The bone surface is jagged and ragged from rubbing on each other. Cartilage is no longer there to protect it and you end up with an arthritic inflamed joint as a result. Now, most of the motion in our spine takes place in the neck and in the lower back. Therefore, the facet joints in the neck 
and lower back are most prone to develop arthritic changes. So most people with facet joint disease and facet arthritis and pain have neck pain or lower back pain as a result. Now you can get facet disease elsewhere, but at the, as there is less motion in the remainder of the spine, you are less likely to have developed facet arthritis or pain elsewhere in the spine. Again, most common in the neck and lower back where motion is mostly taking place. Now, this normal process of wear and tear in our joints, which if you live long enough is almost inevitable in everybody, can be exacerbated by certain factors, including being overweight or obese, fracture of the spine, poor posture, repetitive bending or twisting, sedentary lifestyle, sudden vigorous stretching, torn ligaments, trauma uh, from an accident or fall or sports injury. So all of these factors can aggravate the development or aggravate already existing fast facet arthritis. I want to show you what a normal facet looks like. This is an example of a normal facet on a CAT scan. And in the diagram you see here, here is the facet back here. And you can see that the facet joint is well preserved and the surface of the bone on in the facet is rather smooth. What happens with arthritis is the facet joint narrows. So you can see that here, the facet joint is narrowed. Also the surface of the bone lining the facet joint is rather irregular and jagged. Furthermore, you notice that the size of the bones that make up the facet joint here, and look at here, look at how large they've gotten. And that extra bone that develops as a result of arthritis is called a bone spur, and it is a common manifestation of arthritic changes in joints, including the facet joint as you see here. Now, what are the symptoms of facet arthritis? Well, pain, of course, and tenderness, and typically the pain is slightly off to the side. It's not exactly midline, no. It's slightly off to the side because the facet joints are slightly off to the side, as you recall from the diagram I showed you earlier in the presentation. The pain tends to be worse first thing in the morning and then gradually improves with activity. That is a very, very common symptom and actually a feature of sim symptom related to facet arthritis. Worse in the morning, gradually improving throughout the day with activity. Things that can aggravate it include standing, for example, if you're standing in line for a prolonged period of time, or stooping forward, for example, gardening, uh, stooping forward for prolonged periods of time, or stooping backward for prolonged periods of time. These are factors that put excess pressure on the joint, the facet joint, and can aggravate arthritic pain. Muscle spasm and stiffness is almost always a constant companion of facet arthritis. They go hand in hand in almost every patient that has facet arthritis. Now the first line of therapy is conservative management, including modification of activity, rest. Physical therapy is extremely important. During physical therapy, you participate in flexibility and stretching exercises, which attempt to strengthen the muscles in your back. Our weight is carried by the bones in our spine, in addition to the muscles in our back. And if the muscles are weak, then the bones are placed and the, our facet joints are placed under excessive stress. And so strengthening the muscles to carry that burden becomes extremely important to help relieve facet pain. And in addition, to lessen the chance or hopefully obliterate the chance that facet pain will come back. So physical therapy, extremely important part of management of facet pain. Medications are all, almost always used to help patients get through the acute phase of facet arthritis, including the use of muscle relaxants, anti-inflammatory medications, and pain medications. 
uh, lumbar support for lower back and neck collar for neck pain is often helpful as these take the burden of supporting your weight off of your spine somewhat by providing a some support external support for your back or neck and of course weight optimization losing weight extremely helpful to take the stress off those arthritic joints now if conservative management doesn't work, then we do have minimally invasive treatments available. These are non-surgical treatments to manage pain associated with facet arthritis. These include facet injections, and what we do during this procedure is we inject a steroid and an anesthetic agent into the joint. These are outpatient procedures you come, have the procedure done, get up from the table, and you can go home right after. They do not require hospitalization. They are either done under x-ray guidance, and here's an example of the procedure being done under x-ray guidance. The facet joint is seen under x-ray, uh, and you can actually see it here. The red arrows are outlining two dark lines. The space between the two dark lines is the joint space. And so the target for us when we do a facet injection is to direct the needle into that open space between the two dark lines, as has been done in this patient at the lower level. You can see down here, those two dark lines are identified, and the needle is directed into the open space right between the two dark lines. And the injection of steroid and the numbing medication is done into the facet joint in this manner under x-ray guidance. Now sometimes these facet joints are difficult to see under x-ray and in that case we use a CAT scan and here's an example of a CAT scan guided injection. That's the needle that is directed straight into the joint space between those two bones that make up the joint and the CAT scan provides precise and accurate localization for us to be able to direct our needle into the joint space successfully and inject the numbing medication and steroid into the joint space. Now here's an example of severe arthritic changes in a joint in a 90-year-old woman where x-rays were absolutely not helpful in identifying the joint space. You can see, for example, in the joint here, there's the joint space. And there's been such overgrowth of bone that actually the bone has grown over, obstructing the opening somewhat of the joint space, so that if you were come to at a straight line like that, you would never get to the joint space. But you have to do it under CAT scan where you identify that, okay, my path is going to be this way. And that's the path that was taken, as you can see in here, with the needle directed into the joint space under the guidance of the CT scan. So CT scan, very, very helpful in patients where we can't visualize the joint space on their x-rays. Now, if you have the facet injection and you have relief of pain, but you have recurrence of pain, say for example, you've had one or two injections in the past two years where you've had successful relief of pain initially, but it comes back and you've had to come back for repetitive injections. We have another procedure available for those patients, and that's a radiofrequency ablation procedure. And what's done in this procedure is that the nerve that is responsible for transmitting pain signals from the joint, basically that nerve is deadened. We use a microelectrode and insert a microelectrode, which basically is a needle, right adjacent to the joint where we know that nerve resides, and we heat up the local tissue, which results in burning of the nerve. And in that way, the nerve is no longer able to transmit pain fibers it receives from the facet joint to the brain. This is a very successful procedure that will give longer term, much longer term pain relief
related to facet arthritis. In summary, we have been talking about one of the more common causes of back and neck pain, namely facet degeneration. I hope that you have found this informative. Thank you for your attention.